Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, which is an introduction to grants. My name is Nathan Zabidio, and I am an Associate Director of Program Operations here at Fractured Atlas. I hope that everyone can hear me okay. Uh, if at any time there is an audio issue, please use the Zoom webinar chat functionality to message me, and I will do my best to troubleshoot the problem. In fact, would someone mind using either the chat or Q&A functionality to confirm that you can indeed hear the sound of my voice? That would be incredibly reassuring to me, to know that I'm not just talking into the ether. Thank you so much. Oh, great, getting a bunch of confirmations. One time I started giving one of these webinars and got about 15 minutes through my spiel before someone chimed in on the chat. Is this thing still happening because I'd forgotten to actually hit play? So I'm glad to hear that everyone can, um, can indeed hear me. And I'm hoping that you can see a slide that says Introduction to Grants with my name and title. Uh, tonight's webinar is being recorded. Um, so don't feel pressured to jot down copious amounts of notes. I'm going to send you all a link to the recording later this week which you're welcome to share with anyone that you think might be interested. Um, so if, if you have collaborators or friends who you think could make use of this material, go ahead and, and send them the link uh, once it's available, which again, should hopefully be later this week. There'll also be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to chat me questions throughout. If your query is relevant, I might stop what I'm talking about and answer it in the moment. Otherwise, I will more likely save all questions for the end. But before we get much further, I'd like to say that it's nice to meet you all, even in this digital setting. This is a picture of my face, not just a random human being. A little bit about myself. Again, my name is Nathan Zabidio, and my title is Associate Director of Program Operations. I've been with Fractured Atlas for a little more than six years at this point, but prior to that, I was actually a card-carrying member using Fractured Atlas's programs and services to produce some independent theater projects here in Manhattan, which segued pretty nicely into a position on the programs team where I've been ever since, working with a team that currently consists of 12 artists and arts administrators that service our at this point, 70,000 plus members, um, and that's an international number. We have artists all across the world, certainly across the United States and in New York, but on every continent. Um, uh, that number, 70,000 members, includes around 4,000 fiscally sponsored artists, arts projects, or arts organizations. Since 2002, we've helped artists raise over $141 million, almost $24 million of which was in the last 12 months alone. And the way I like to describe my job is that I help empower artists and startup arts companies become more effective fundraisers, certainly in the realm of grants, which is what we're specifically here to talk about tonight. Uh, so let's go over briefly what a table of contents for what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to answer the following questions. First, what is a grant? <laughs> it helps to start with the basics, and before you start looking for grants, it's important to know the role that grant making plays in the nonprofit sector at large. A am I ready to apply for grants? There are I's to dot and T's to cross before you're a truly competitive grant seeker. How do I find grants that are right for me? What do I need to prepare when I'm working on a grant application? And finally, how do I work with Fractured Atlas when submitting a grant proposal? As you probably already know, with fiscal sponsorship, Fractured Atlas extends some of the benefits of our 501c3 status to artists, arts projects, and arts organizations in order to open the doors to funding opportunities that they are not otherwise eligible for on their own. Most arts funding in the United States comes from individual donors. 
And our fiscal sponsorship program does enable you to solicit tax-deductible donations from individuals, but it can also make you eligible for certain grant opportunities. In this breakdown, you'll see that almost two-thirds, 59%, of contributed revenue for our fiscally sponsored projects comes from individual donors. And this is largely true for other arts nonprofits across the United States. So this breakdown maps to what many other arts organizations see in terms of where their contributed revenue comes from. But in today's webinar, we'll be talking about how to access the remaining 41% of contributed revenue, which comes in the form of funding from institutions, otherwise known as grants. So to begin, what is a grant? Charitably inclined individuals and families, as well as corporations, often want to give back to their communities or financially support causes that are dear to them. To do so, they sometimes form a foundation, a separate legal entity, and endow it with their funds to be donated in the form of a grant. These grants then go to support projects or organizations that align with the interests of the funders. Because there are tax incentives for the individuals and corporations that want to form foundations, the IRS oversees their giving activities. Grants from a foundation must be made for charitable purposes within specific guidelines that are often outlined in the foundation's charter that is filed with the IRS. Grants can also be awarded by local, state, or federal government entities. And some grants can be made to individuals, but most are only available to organizations who've received 501c3 status from the IRS. Foundations can award their grants in two different ways. First, they sometimes award grants as the result of a competitive application process where they accept submissions from grant seekers and decide how to allocate fun funds among the best applicants. Foundations can also award grants on a discretionary basis, meaning that they likely don't accept unsolicited submissions, but that individuals, projects, and or organizations are selected and funded at the behest of the foundation's decision makers, which is usually their board of directors or trustees. More on competitive and discretionary funding shortly, though. So, as you are probably aware, grant funding is limited and competitive. In fact, year over year, we've seen that the pot of money available in the form of grants from institutional funders has been shrinking. Uh, the lion's share of contributed revenue for arts organizations in the United States, again, comes from individual donors. So we strongly encourage artists to prioritize individual giving when creating a fundraising plan for their project or company. Before you spend time writing grant proposals, you need to determine your level of grant readiness, which I would describe as how prepared you are to pitch yourself, your project, or your company as competent and successful enough to warrant consideration by a foundation. There certainly are grants out there for seed money and emergency grants for artists and arts organizations who are in a pinch, but the vast majority of opportunities are for grant seekers who are already on their feet, have a proven track record of success, are fiscally solvent, and are already making an impact in their field or discipline. When our fiscally sponsored projects want to apply for grants, we require that they've raised at least $1,000 from other sources first. This eligibility requirement is based on feedback from grant makers who are typically uninterested in awarding grants to artists and arts organizations that do not have existing revenue streams or committed support from their community and other funders. We also advise you to have a body of work under your belt before you consider applying to foundations for grants. Likely, they will want to see a, a track record of success of at least two years before they will find you a truly competitive candidate for funding. 
When a funder is evaluating whether or not they want to award you a grant, they want to ensure that their funds are being used as effectively and efficiently as possible. So they're unlikely to fund projects where their grant represents a significant portion of the total project budget. It's also important to note that grant funding often has a longer fuse than individual giving. And what I mean by that is when you submit a grant proposal, you might not hear back from the foundation with their decision for several months. And it might be even longer for them to cut you a check. So if you need that grant for your play next month, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to turn around and actually cut you a check in, in that amount of time. So this is all a long way of saying that you must not look to grants as your primary source of contributed income to meet immediately pressing needs. Let's revisit this breakdown of contributed revenue one more time. You should expect around or at least 59% of your contributed income to come from individual donors. And this is what you should use to meet your pressing needs. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if you were to break down the hours in a day that you're going to spend fundraising, at least 59% of your time should be spent on soliciting individual donors. And maybe then slightly less than half, 41%, should actually be spent on identifying grant funders and writing those grant proposals. Uh, the primary goal of institutional funders is not to fill in your budget shortfalls. Rather, they want to award grants that will amplify and improve the awesome work that you're already doing. To help illustrate these points, let's talk through a checklist that you might want to go through to evaluate your own grant readiness. Again, this is about being able to sell yourself as competent and successful. So first, under competence. Have I raised th that $1,000 that Fractured Atlas requires within the last two years for the work that I'm seeking funding for? What's more, do I have diverse revenue streams? So donations, in-kind support in the form of non-cash gifts, uh, ticket sales, merchandise sales, advertising, etc., and a plan for maintaining these over the long haul. And even further, do I have a detailed budget for my project or company that outlines both my planned income and expenditures? I can speak from experience here that many projects or companies, especially those that are new or small, have an off-the-cuff approach to their finances and don't have long-term or even mid-term projections for where they're heading and how they plan to get there. So if this describes you, then you're probably not yet ready to apply for grants. Under the success uh, column here, have I been in operation for at least two years? Can I point to a body of work that demonstrates my track record? And do I have evidence that documents that work? For example, photos from past productions, an active website, and engaged online social media presence, sample marketing materials, testimonials from people who've experienced the work. So even if we only require that our fiscally sponsored projects meet that first bullet point, where they've raised at least $1,000 before they're technically eligible to apply for grants, we would argue that there's a difference between mere eligibility and actual competitiveness. And in my opinion, only if you can answer yes to most of, if not all, six of the questions on this checklist should you consider yourself a truly competitive grant seeker. So once we've established our readiness, we can start looking for appropriate grants for which we might be a good fit. Let's talk through a few recommended resources to begin your search. Fortunately, Fractured Atlas can give you a leg up in identifying funders who might be appropriate for your project or company. We've developed a grant toolkit that we customize for each of our fiscally sponsored projects. All you need to do is email us to request that we create a toolkit for you and quickly remind us of your artistic discipline. So you'd say, I'm a theater artist or a filmmaker or um, a choreographer. Uh, and then the geographic area in which you operate. And within two weeks, 
we'll prepare a toolkit for you that includes a list of funders for you to research further. In addition to our grant toolkit, we regularly post upcoming grant deadlines to our blog, and this list goes out in our monthly fiscal sponsorship newsletter. Uh, this toolkit also contains some great educational resources for prospecting grant makers. The list of funders that we provide is by no means an exhaustive list, and you will actually still need to do some detective work to determine which prospects on the list are truly perfect fits for your project. So there's no substitute for you also doing your own research. And let's quickly talk through how you'd go about doing this. One go-to resource that you should immediately investigate is your local arts council. Most cities or counties will have an arts council that might be a funding organization that you can apply to for grants in its own right, but will likely also be a wealth of knowledge for artists and arts organizations in your area. And your local arts council might have some good leads for other grant makers that you should check out. But beyond that, there are a couple of great online resources that we strongly recommend that you use. The first is the Foundation Center. They are an online database of funders in all fields and disciplines internationally. So not just um, the arts, but education, um, science, medical field, um, different medical fields um, and are not just limited to the United States so you can find funders internationally using the Foundation Center as well. You do need to pay a fee in order to access their listing online but they also have in-person library locations where you can go to search the, uh, the database for free. Their official locations are in just a few cities across the United States, like New York, but they also partner with several local libraries and organizations like community centers in what they call their funding information network. You can visit these partner organizations and also search the listing for free. Take a look at the Foundation Center website for more info. Again, you'll find uh, all of the partner organizations under the funding information network. And in addition to the database, the Foundation Center also provides great educational resources. I've attended some of the trainings myself, and these come in the form of both online webinars such as this and in-person training sessions. Using the Foundation Center, you can do a highly customizable search of foundations using a lot of different criteria. For example, what geographic areas do they fund projects in? Um, broadly, or incredibly specifically as so you can say I'm looking for all Michigan funders or you can say I'm looking for Detroit funders uh, what artistic disciplines are they interested in so not just arts and culture broadly but are they interested in theater projects and do they accept unsolicited proposals it's an important question to ask of a funder so that you know that your application if you write one up will actually get looked at and most grant makers have profiles on the Foundation Center's website. Many of these profiles contain a wealth of information that you can use to determine if the funder is a good fit. Uh, for example, you'll often find a list of staff or board members at the Foundation. And I usually encourage people to cross-check that list to see if they know any of them personally. Maybe try and do some light Facebook stalking of them to see if they're in your network or a few degrees of separation away from you and and hopefully you can reach out to them through your mutual contacts another online resource that we recommend is NIFA source which is by the New York Foundation for the Arts uh, on a personal level I actually found my job at Fractured Atlas through a job posting on NIFA source so I, I I can speak from personal experience that this is a great resource so you'll find a listing of not only grants, but also job postings, fellowships, and other services for artists. And it's not just for New York-based artists. The opportunities posted here are nationwide, and unlike Foundation Center, NIFA Source is free to access. And then finally, I recommend looking at other artists and arts organizations in your community. Check out their websites, newsletters, playbills, etc., to see if they're getting any grants, and then add those to your list of funders to do some further research on. So, once you've used some combination of our grant toolkit and blog, 
local arts councils, the foundation center, NIFA source, and maybe even some light Googling, you'll probably have arrived at a fairly long list of potential funders to do further research on. And your work does not end here. I cannot emphasize enough, once you've arrived at a list of prospects, you shouldn't just then send them a blanket solicitation letter. Instead, you need to par this list down even further to find the handful of funders for which you're a truly competitive fit. So what do you do next? First off, check out the funder's website. If there's a formal application process, you'll find the guidelines there. But according to the Foundation Center, around 90% of funders actually don't have their own websites, even in the year 2018. So what do you do then? Well, there's another great online resource, this one totally free, called GuideStar. All US foundations and nonprofit organizations like Fractured Atlas have profiles on GuideStar. A foundation's profile will include their most recent 990s, a 990 being the tax form that foundations and nonprofits need to file with the IRS each year. So let's talk a little bit about that, Form 990. A funder's 990 is not the most exciting document in the world, to be sure, but if you learn to read between the lines, you can find a lot of information that could help you determine if a foundation is a good fit for you. When I'm looking at a 990, one of the first things I do is scroll down to part 15. They use Roman numerals, so it'll be part XV, where you can learn more about how a grant maker accepts applications. This is especially useful if the foundation doesn't have a website with info about how to submit. Sometimes the 990 will include a description of the types of requests that they fund, what to send the funder, any supplemental documentation to provide with your submission, and the contact info for the person to whom your request should be addressed. But most importantly, part 15 asks a crucial question to which you should pay special attention. This is the direct quote here from Form 990. Check here if the foundation only makes contributions to pre-selected charitable organizations and does not accept unsolicited requests for funds. So if the foundation has this box checked off, that means that they only engage in discretionary funding, not competitive funding, meaning that no amount of sending them letters or proposals out of the blue is gonna get you noticed because they're not looking at just all the mail that comes in and making a decision based on that. They're actually at the staff or board level saying, I like this organization or I like this project and, and that's how we're gonna award them a grant. So if the foundation has this box checked off, then there are two things you can do. Maybe you decide to just cross this funder off your list of prospects as they don't have a competitive funding opportunity. Or you can see if there's a way to make it onto their list of pre-selected charitable organizations. On the 990, you'll be able to see who else has received an award from the funder that year. So pay careful attention to that, especially the award amounts. When you look at who's received funding from a given grantor, you can also see the size of the grant that they were awarded. So you'll have a sense for the range of grant amounts that a funder offers, and this can serve a couple of purposes. First off, it will continue to help you evaluate your competitiveness for a given foundation. So if they only award grants of $100,000 or more, and your total budget is only $10,000, then they're not right for you until you become a much, much bigger enterprise. Also, it'll help you decide what an appropriate ask amount might be if you ultimately do submit a proposal. So, you know, you're looking at a list of previously awarded grants and you see that a foundation typically only awards grants of $5,000 or less. Well, then you know that's a good sign that you shouldn't ask for much more than 5,000. In fact, you should probably limit your ask amount to 5,000 when you send in your proposal. And then in the 990, you can also find out who works for the foundation and who is on their board of directors. Part eight of the 990 will list the highest paid employees at the foundation, if applicable, if they have paid employees, as well as the members of their board of directors. 
And if the funder states that they only support pre-selected organizations, again, take a look at this list of names, share it with your collaborators in your inner circle, and see if anyone that you know is on the board or is friendly with a member of the board and can facilitate an introduction. Okay, so after we've gone to 990, we've looked, we've, after we've gone to GuideStar and looked at the 990, uh, maybe we've seen that there's a phone number or email address, uh, any contact info whatsoever, to try to connect with someone at the foundation to gather more details. A former director of development at Fractured Atlas, uh, someone who has raised tens of millions of dollars for major cultural institutions in New York City, once told me that she was only successful at being awarded a grant after she was able to make a personal contact with the funder before submitting the proposal. Now, I think she's probably exaggerating slightly, but it's important to remember that fundraising in general, which includes grant seeking, is about relationship building. And you're more likely to be successfully awarded a grant if you've worked on cultivating a relationship with the funder before you even ask them for money. Uh, even ask them for money. So you find a phone number for a program officer at the foundation. You give them a call and you say, "Hey, I'm a small dance company in Boise, Idaho, and based on what I can tell, I think I might be a good fit for your foundation." Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. I have a couple of questions prepared for, um, you know, what the application process is like, what you normally look for in, in applicants, and you start building a relationship with this program officer. Then a couple of weeks in the future, they see your proposal come in. They're like, oh, I, I talked to that person. I, I know this dance company in Boise, Idaho. Maybe they're that much more likely to make sure that your proposal gets seen by the right people or uh, you know, treat it with uh, a generous consideration. Um, so where possible, once you've looked at the website, once you've looked at their 990, reach out to them to make a personal introduction and, and hopefully learn more about this particular funder's priorities. So, if you've done your homework, you've completed your due diligence for being a responsible grant seeker, remember the goal of this research is to give you the info that you need to be able to make a, a judgment call for whether or not you're an appropriate fit for a given funder's mission and activities. So. What are the key pieces of information that you want to take away from your research? Um, I hope you'll indulge me one more checklist. Let's talk through the, the items that we're trying to ascertain. Do they have an open competitive application process or do they only award discretionary funding? Do they fund projects or companies like mine in my geographic area? Should be self-explanatory, but do they have any upcoming deadlines? Because we're going to want to pay attention to those. What documentation do they need from me and possibly from my fiscal sponsor? For that matter, do they even fund fiscally sponsored projects? We operate under the assumption that unless a funder explicitly states otherwise, they'd be willing to work with a fiscally sponsored project to award a grant. But there are some that do not award grants to uh, to fiscal sponsors, most notably the National Endowment for the Arts. And is there someone at the foundation that I can contact to learn more about their process and priorities? So these are the major items that I'd be looking to get some answers to if I'm doing research on a specific foundation to, to figure out if I'm a good fit and if I'm going to submit an application. Ultimately, all of this research is getting back to learning more about the funder's mission and priorities. So you should only, only apply to a given foundation if their goals align with your project's or company's goals. So don't stretch your mission or activities to match a funding opportunity. For example, if a grant maker funds, I don't know, teaching artist programs, it's not a great idea to add a teaching artist program to your activities just to be eligible to apply for the grant, especially if it's not relevant to your mission or, or other programming. By the same token, funders can tell when you're sending a blanket application letter to lots of different grant makers. 
we strongly discourage you from doing this. Unlike individual giving, grant seeking is not a numbers game where the more applications you send out, the more likely you are to get a grant. Uh, foundations are also in regular contact with each other at conferences and other networking events, and they usually talk about applicants who submitted proposals to them. So it won't do you any favors to submit proposals to foundations that are not appropriate fits, because somewhere down the line, another foundation is going to say, oh yeah, I also received a random application from this person. They must not really know what they're doing. If you're ultimately unable to glean any useful info from their website, their 990, or contact someone at the funder, then it's almost certainly not a good use of your time to submit a proposal to them, and you should, with no reservations, cross that foundation off your list. Hopefully, however, this research will have led you to the small handful of grant opportunities that are perfect for your work. So. Once you've found some good prospects, it's time to start writing your submission. First, it's important to determine if you're preparing what is known as a letter of inquiry, often abbreviated to LOI, or a full proposal. The funder's website, their 990, or a conversation with someone on the foundation staff should help you figure out what to work on. An LOI is a brief written request for funding consideration. Sometimes it's the only part of the application process, but often it's just the first step. In the LOI, you're usually asking for an invitation to submit a full proposal that goes, that goes into more detail on your needs and your programming. So to that extent, the LOI is a mini version of the longer proposal that you'll hopefully get the chance to send. Unless the funder explicitly states otherwise, your LOI should be about two to three pages in length. And here are the things that you need to consider putting in both the LOI in abbreviated form and a longer proposal. First, an executive level project summary that articulates your goals and what is being requested of the funder. So be sure to have a specific ask amount in mind uh, for each funder that you might be reaching out to and, and be able to articulate it clearly in your submission. Keep in mind that your ask amount should represent a relatively small proportion of your total project or company budget, how much to request can vary depending on a specific funder's guidelines, but we generally recommend that you limit your ask amount to less than 25% of your project budget, and if possible, to less than 10% of your project budget. Separately, you'll want to prepare a need statement that demonstrates that your project or company is playing a vital role in solving a problem or addressing an issue in your field of interest. And you're offering the funder the chance to be a part of that novel so solution that you're proposing. So something along the lines of, in the last five years, funding for arts programs in my hometown has been eliminated from the budget entirely. And as a result, students at our local high school don't have in-school opportunities to develop their artistic talents. So our organization provides free after-school uh, educational opportunities for budding young artists. And we're asking for a grant to help reach more students than we previously have the last several years. Uh, next, you'll want to have an, a, a good story, a narrative that tells the who, what, where, when, how, and why, which is where you're going to make the case that what you're doing is innovative and worthy of support. And you'll describe who you're serving and how you're going to accomplish your mission. Separately, from your narrative. You'll want to have an outline of the specific outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So as a result of the work that you're doing, what do you hope will happen with, with your company, with your discipline, or with your community? And how do you plan to measure those outcomes? How will you know that you've been successful? So those can be qualitative or quantitative. Um, a qualitative example would be uh, the ideal result of our after-school arts 
education programming is that students will will be empowered to stand up to bullying in their school. A quantitative result could be studies have shown that students, high school students that are exposed to arts programming show an increase in their SAT scores of at least 200 points. Uh, we hope that our after-school education program will accomplish that result. Um, usually, you probably want to have both some qualitative and quantitative results uh, and outcomes that you'd outline in your proposal um, as benchmarks to show, oh, we're doing this after-school programming or whatever our project is. We're yielding these results, and, and we know as a result that, we, that it's, it's been successful. Another ingredient to an LOI or proposal is a, a thoughtful description of your own qualifications. Why are you and or your team the right people for the job? So it could be a resume or CV or it could be just a brief bio for you and, and the other key players in your project. You also want to have prepared a budget. In an LOI, you might not be required to submit a budget document, but you should have one prepared regardless. Even in an LOI, you still want to indicate your total project or company budget and how much you've raised for the work so far so that the funder has an idea of how their grant would fit into your overall fundraising plan. We fortunately have a separate webinar for budgets, which we encourage you to check out. Um, in a grant application budget, you would want to include a thorough list of both your expenses, but also a list of your sources of revenue, both committed and pending. So you'd say the total costs for this after-school program is $15,000, and here's a breakdown of what all that means. In order to raise that $15,000, we're asking for a $3,000 grant from you, so that's pending. We've run a successful $7,000 crowdfunding campaign, so that's committed, and you know a list of whatever other uh, income streams that you plan to engage in, you know, a bake sale, a fundraising event, so that the funder has an idea of, well, okay, they're asking for 3,000 from us, and this is how they plan to raise the remaining 12. So that's just a summary of the ingredients that I just listed um, that would either go into your LOI or full proposal. Defer to the foundation's guidelines wherever possible. So if they list the specific things that they want you to include, don't just go off of this list, but you know, follow their guidelines. Uh, and be sure to follow them to the letter. Beyond that, make sure that the little details, formatting, spelling, etc., are spot on before you submit. Um, you know, definitely have as many sets of eyes proofread your LOI or proposal before it goes out. Don't want to have any typos in there. Fortunately, if you're fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, you will have our set of eyes reviewing your grant applications before they're submitted to provide feedback. As with all fundraising materials, grant applications from our fiscally sponsored projects need to be reviewed and approved by a Fractured Atlas staff member before they're to be submitted to the funder. With certain applications, it's possible that Fractured Atlas will need to submit them on your behalf. For grant makers that accept online applications, we may need to set up login credentials for you in order for you to be able to submit. But in any case, just email us at support at fracturedatlas.org about any grant opportunities or proposals that you're working on so that we can get the ball rolling and hopefully provide specific instructions for that particular opportunity. So for grant applications, we ask for 10 business days to review and approve your materials. This allows us to take a deep dive on your proposal and also to thoroughly research the funder. If applicable, we will provide feedback that will hopefully help maximize the effectiveness and competitiveness of your submission. If you need us to expedite review of a grant application, we often need to charge a $75 rush fee. 
As you research funders, we encourage you to keep a grants calendar where you mark the grant deadline and also the Fractured Atlas deadline for 10 business days prior to when the completed application is due. Most grant applications will require some kind of documentation from Fractured Atlas, like a sponsorship confirmation letter from us, our IRS determination letter that confirms our 501c3 status, our own 990, so potentially our tax form, audited financials, board list, uh, the list goes on and on of things that a funder might want from us as your fiscal sponsor. And the 10 business day window allows us the time to gather those materials. When we review your grant application, we will be looking to see that you've included the standard text for grants. This is a one paragraph summary of the fiscal sponsorship arrangement and can be found in a few different places on our website, in the program guidelines on your My Fiscal Sponsorship page and in our online knowledge base. Okay, so if and when you're awarded a grant, it's likely that there will be a contract involved. Uh, which Fractured Atlas may need to sign, uh, or you might be able to sign it on your own. Uh, really, there isn't a one-size-fits-all uh, set of instructions I can give you. Um, there might even be some combination of the two. You need to sign it, we need to sign it, and then it goes to the funder. Uh, so just expect to need to work with us on the completion of the contract. Uh, one common contractual requirement is that many funders ask for follow-up reports on how their funds are being used. Sometimes it'll just be a single final report, maybe even with a form that the funder sends you to fill out. Other times it will be one or more progress reports. And we'll set up automated reminders in our system to ping you when the reports are due. Uh, which, as with other grant materials, we ask that you send your grant reports to us for review before they're submitted to the funder. Okay, phew. We've reached the end of my prepared remarks. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I'm going to open up for questions shortly. But before I do, I want to quickly plug our other webinars. This is just one in a series. You can find upcoming presentations listed on our website and also recordings of past webinars in the knowledge base. Uh, again, I'm going to send you all via email a link to the recording for this webinar later this week. Um, I really hope this material was useful to you. Uh, thank you so much for attending. I'm going to open up for questions now. There haven't been any added yet. So I hope there weren't any technical issues and that you were all actually able to hear and see my presentation. Um, we still have about 17 minutes till eight, but if there aren't any questions, I'm happy to end the call early. As you might be able to tell, I'm vamping here to allow you to type if you have any questions. But if you don't, I also hope you've got some yummy dinners waiting for you. Gonna give a couple last seconds for if anyone has any questions. All right, well, I, I again hope this was useful information. Feel free to email us at support at fracturedatlas.org or call us at 888-692-7878 if you have any grant-related questions or any fundraising questions not grant-related. Um, we're not a call center, so if you're not able to get through to us right away, leave a voicemail or send a follow-up email and we'll be happy to respond within one or two business days. You can look out for that email from me with the recording to this later this week. But in the absence of questions, I'm going to end the call. Hope you all have a good night and that we talk soon, hopefully about grants and, and how Fractured Atlas's fiscal sponsorship program can help you obtain that funding. All right, have a good night.